Okay, good morning, church. How are we doing today? You guys sounded amazing. You sounded great uh, in worship. One of the, the things that I, I don't love about our, our morning setup is that in the last song, I have to kind of make my way around to get ready to come on, and that's when you guys are like going for it. You guys are, are nailing it. So when we finish this, this message, I'm going to step off and the band's going to play another song like we always do. I want you guys to go for it again because then I get to listen to it and I get to be a part of it. So yeah, I'm excited for that. But listen, I'm excited to be here with you today, not only because you guys had a lot of energy this morning, but I've got a lot of energy for you. I, I really have been excited about this relationship series that we've been doing and we've really been focusing on rebuilding relationships. So I'm not trying to tell you how to start one. So for those of you that are single, and you've been looking for maybe some advice and you keep thinking, I keep coming to church, but he's just telling me how to fix things when they go bad. He's not telling me how to actually start the relationship that I'm hoping to start with this person that I like. So, but we've been hitting on some really sensitive things. And, and this to me has been a real, uh, it's been a real passion project of mine because so much of our life, it just revolves around relationships, whether we're passive about them or active with them, but it, it revolves around relationships and that's so important for us and we've been talking about this topic that this idea that maintaining and and starting a relationship is a lot easier than it is to fix a relationship so in fact we are better at starting and maintaining relationships than we are at fixing relationships when they break now when when I first introduced this topic I, I told you about a car so it's easy to to start a car for most of us. You get in, you turn the key, it starts. You can figure that out. You could take somebody who's never driven a car and you could give them a key and they could probably intuitively figure out how to start the car. Same with maintaining it and keeping it going. I mean, some of you maybe don't understand you have to put oil in your car every now and again, but even at the petrol stations, they make that really hard for you to do because when you pull through, they say, you know, top up on oil, water, air pressure, tires. You do all that for you. It's easy to keep your car going and to keep it maintained. But what's difficult to do is to fix it when it breaks. So very few of us in here can work on our own cars. And if you can, then you are a rare breed. You're an exceptional person. And I know for me, you know, if a check engine light comes on, it's like the prayers start. You know, you're down on your knees. I'll actually tell, tell you, this is a true story. I was living in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. I had quit my job and I was working for the mission organization that I would one day come to South Africa for originally like 10 years ago. And I was, I was working down there and I got into my car one morning. It was a, we called it a Subaru. You guys call it a Subaru, which for, you know, yeah, it sounds weird, doesn't it? So I got in it and I turned it on. The check engine light came on and it sounded funny. And I thought, oh man, here I am raising money, trying to, you know, you know, get ready to go overseas, and I just immediately turned the car off. I was like, I don't even want to see it, and, and I, I did, tried this thing where I thought, okay, God, you're God. You, you can be God over this car, and so I'm just weirdly sitting in a parking lot, and I put my hand on it, and I say, Lord, just fix this car, and guess what? I started it up, and the check engine light was off, and it worked perfectly, and it was like, wow, that actually worked, and I tried it on my bank account and other things, <laughs> but it... It did not work. One last funny story about a car. None of this is planned. I should hurry and move on. But when Casey and I were living in Nelspruit, we were getting ready to come to Cape Town on a trip. We were getting ready to drive all the way down here. You know where I'm, I don't know if you remember. We pull into a parking spot. I, I, I had a Ford at the time, a Ford Ranger. And we pull into a parking spot, and I go to put it in first gear, and it doesn't go, and I give it a good, like, kind of shake, and the whole gear le lever, the manual transmission just broke off. It was just in my, in my hand. And that was a moment where prayer did not fix that situation. We were actually stuck in the parking lot. But anyway, the point is, is that it's really hard to fix something that's broken in cars, and relationships are the same way. In fact, relationships are probably a lot harder. And I know this because I, I see it in my life and I see it in your lives. I mean, you guys come to us for counseling and for help and I see that this is happening in your life. But fixing relationships are hard because when they break, a part of us breaks. And when a part of us breaks over and over and over and over again, we start to develop a little bit of a narrative. 
we start to come up with, with some defense mechanisms. And I'm going to talk about some of those defense mechanisms right, right now. So the first defense mechanism is this, I don't care. I don't know who's, who's there now or who's been there. But to find yourself in a place in a relationship with somebody where you look at them and you say, you know what, I don't care. I can't care anymore. I, can't, I, can't, I can no longer care about what's broken in this relationship, this marriage, this relationship with my boss. But I've reached the point where I'm up to here with this thing. And I just no longer care. Now, this is a very dangerous statement. It's dangerous if we're married. It's dangerous if we're not married. It's dangerous anywhere that we use it to get to a place where we say, I don't care. And what's dangerous about it is it's kind of like we're, we're just giving up. It's a defense mechanism. And in fact, what, what I don't care actually means, it means I'm powerless. I'm powerless to do anything about it, but I wish that I could. And so we say, because everything I've tried, it doesn't work. Because I'm powerless about this situation, I'm powerless in this situation, I'm going to numb myself down. And I'm going to say I don't care. Now, we actually do care about the things we say we don't care about. So you may be sitting there saying, no, actually, Chris, you don't know me. I really don't care about this relationship. But I would, I would say, actually, you probably do. The things that we don't care about don't even blip on our radar. Those are the things that we don't even make a statement. You know, of, of, we don't even think to say I don't care about it because you actually don't care about it. But if something comes across your life and you find yourself feeling powerless to do anything about it, but you wish you could, don't go to a place of I don't care. Don't let yourself get to that place because it's dangerous. It's, it's you taking a step away from that person. Now, I always like to, as, as I was preparing for this message, I always like to think about things from my perspective or how they impact me. Or I like to put myself in these messages. And what I, I keep thinking about in this message with, these, with this I don't care statement is I think about the people that refused to say I don't care about me. I, I, I'm so thankful that throughout my life that there were people that just, they, they fought me and they fought me and they fought me and they just never stopped and they never stopped. And no matter how powerless they may have felt over time, they just refused to say, I don't care. And I'm better because of that. I am who I am because there's some amazing people that have been in my life. So if you find yourself in a position where you're wondering, do I actually care about this? relationship or this problem can I actually care about this anymore I'm so powerless I just want to encourage you and try and motivate you to say don't don't go to this place get help bring somebody else into it but don't go to this place now the next thing that I want to talk about is another defense mechanism that we go to and it's it's this here it says I already tried I already tried you find yourself in a, in a relationship or in a season where you just you feel like you've tried everything. You've tried one thing after another, after another, after another. The place where I hear this so often, and it's such a shame and, it, and it's so sad, is, is parents or families that deal with, with addicts or they have people in their life that struggle with addiction and they think, I've tried so many things to help them and it just is no longer helping them. You know, I think about um, maybe you've got somebody in your family that is just rooted in, in certain things in their life where maybe there's been trauma early in their life or they were abused or there was something just horrible that happened to them. And then now you've married into that family. You've married them or you've joined them. And now all of a sudden you're trying to move forward with life, but they keep bringing it back to this hurt or back to this pain and they just can't seem to move forward with you. Or maybe you're trying to save a relationship with a best friend, or you're trying to save a relationship with a husband or a spouse, and, and you find yourself saying, I just, I've already tried. I've, I've already tried. I already tried to do that. And this is so important to see in us that this is a defense mechanism because we're trying to protect ourselves. We're, we're trying to, to take care of ourselves. And if you're in, I, I want to say this up front, if you're in like an abusive relationship, I, I want to say that I'm not, this is not for you. What's for you is you need to go immediately get help. 
You need to go immediately bring somebody into that situation with you. You do not need to sit here and try and justify these things. If you're in an abusive relationship, this is not for you at all. You need to go immediately for help. And if you don't know where to go for help, you can come to us and we can help you find help. But for the rest of us, what I hope to do with this is I hope to motivate you and encourage you. And I hope to get you to, to see in your own relationships with others that don't, don't give up. Don't give up on people. You know, this whole series is, has been about repairing broken relationships. And what today is mostly about is this idea, this concept of just you taking a little bit of ownership in your relationship. And we can't say things like, I already tried and walk away from it if we're no longer willing to take ownership in what's going on. And in fact, it, it's, this is, is an equally dangerous statement because when, when we say that we've already tried, and, and when we say that we're done with the other person, we're done with this relationship, we also stop our pursuit of the other person. So when we say that I've already tried, this is so important. This is why I put this up here for you. When we say that I've already tried and we are done with the relationship, we also stop our pursuit of the other person. We give up. Now this is why this is so important to us. Is this idea of we stop our pursuit of the other person. You know, I'm just going to go ahead outright and say, I'm so thankful that I serve a God or that I sit under a God. I sit under Jesus who never stopped pursuing me. I'm so thankful that, that I can stand on stage and represent a church that represents a Savior who will never give up on you. I'm so thankful that we are in a building. We, are, we collectively are a church so that if you're new here and you don't know anything about what's going on here, when you walk through these doors, I hope that you can learn about us, that we believe that we should never stop pursuing you. And even if we do, that there's a Lord and Savior, that He will never stop pursuing you. That is such a good truth. It's a good truth that we can bank on. It's a good truth that we can say, I'm so thankful that that applies to me, that that applies to me from Jesus. But also, I want to encourage us to say, let, let us try not to stop. Let us try not to say that we are done with the relationship. See, God created us to need each other. He created us. That, that's why we get so lonely when we don't have people. I mean, even me, I'm an extreme ex, or sorry, not extrovert. It's like a cuss word for me. I'm an extreme introvert. I, 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 I'm very, very introverted. But even as a very introverted person, I crave relationships. I crave time with people because Jesus made us that way. There's not a single person that was made to do life alone. Now, what would happen in here and what would happen if all the people in here went out there with a bit of a changed mindset that said, you know what, I'm not going to give up just because I've already tried. I'm just going to keep stepping towards the people in my life that I have broken relationships with or hurt relationships with. Now, the last thing we're going to look at, and, and this is probably one of the most popular defaults that we go to, one of the most popular things that we say, hey, as a protective measure, I'm going to claim this. And, it, and it's this, we say, it's not my fault. This was not my fault. And you know, a lot of us are justified in this. A lot of us are extremely justified with this. A lot of your broken relationships... A lot of the hurt that you have in your relationships, a lot of those relationships that need to be reassembled, that need to be reconciled, you know what? It's not your fault. It, it's not on you. You're not the one that cheated. You're not the one that lied. You're not the one that, that, that chose something that hurt another person. It's, it wasn't you. And by all the standards of the world, you're justified in saying, I want out of this relationship or I want to walk away from this relationship because this was not my fault. You're justified in that. But see, that's where here in this church, in this building, because we, we can claim that Jesus never gives up on us and that Jesus never walks out on us and that Jesus never stops pursuing you, because we can claim that, we also kind of have to claim the other side of that coin. See, it feels really great to say, man, Jesus will never leave you, but I will. You know, Jesus will never give up on you, but it wasn't my fault. 
Jesus is never going to forsake you. He's always going to love you. But I've already tried to love you enough and I'm going to stop loving you now. We can't do that. We can't do that as Jesus followers and we, we can't do that as people. I mean, especially, you know, if you look at what's going on in the world today, there's crazy stuff going on all over the world. And what's happening is people need people, but people are hurting people. And if we're going to be different in here, whether you prescribe to Jesus or not, if we're going to be different here, we're going to stop talking out of the side of our mouth and we're going to declare one truth. The truth that you want for you and over your life has to be the truth that you then live for others. And see, it all starts with us. And, and, and this is what I've been talking about through this series. Reassembly begins with us, regardless of who ignited the fuss. Now, this is a statement that, uh, that I really like because it rhymes. It's easy for me to remember. Reassembly begins with us, regardless of who ignited the fuss. But I love the fact that it implies some ownership. I love the fact that, that it also reminds us of a really valuable, really amazing truth. And that truth that I want you to remember, and we've touched on it, but it's so important that I want to put it on the screen for everyone to read. And it's, I want you to remember that God made the first move for us. God made the first move for you. He made the first move for us. See, when when Adam and Eve sinned, God took Adam and Eve and he took them out of the Garden of Eden. He made them put on clothes. They were all of a sudden aware of their, their nakedness, which is a bummer. And he made them just go through the, the removal of, of leaving this amazing place that God had formed with them. But from the very next instance on, through all of humanity, all the way up to your life and all the way beyond all of our lives, God immediately started to pursue Adam and Eve. He did that when, when he created the first sacrifice. See, the first animal was sacrificed, and that that happened so that Adam and Eve could come to God. God God immediately, the first thing he did is he repaved a way for Adam and Eve to come back to him. And he does that in our life. That has never stopped. That's never stopped in the Bible, and it never will stop. And it doesn't stop with Jesus. In fact, Jesus came, and he reinforced it even more. See, with Jesus, we can make this statement. See, God made... The move not to get back at us, but to get back to us. It wasn't about God saying, you're in trouble, so now I'm going to punish you. It it, it wasn't about God saying, you know what, you get what you deserve. I mean, we all know that that doesn't work well in relationships. We celebrate that sometimes. You know, when someone that's done something wrong to us, when something happens in their life that wasn't that great, we look at them and we're like, yeah, yeah. I hate to hear that, you know, that that happened to you but inside we're celebrating we feel good about it's like something warm happens and I'm so thankful that that God's not that way because God he could have been that way you know we've all seen Avengers I mean God could have pulled a Thanos and just wiped us all out but he didn't do that instead when God snapped his fingers he sent his son to earth And Jesus came to restore the entire earth. He came to restore all of humanity. Even after he was long gone, we still sit here today, 2,000 plus years later, in a a room in Pinelands, talking about this amazing truth that is that God does everything that he does to restore us back to him, to get to us, to get to you. And now, he wants us to do the same for others. Now, if you're wondering why I would say that, why does God want us to do the same for others? I always go back to the greatest commandment. I, I, I love this. You know, I'm not, I don't consider myself a theologian. I just consider myself someone that is desperate to be led by God to communicate to you guys. And, and in that desperation, I always go back to what I think are the simple truths. The things that, that, that theologians can't really argue about. And the simple truth is that when Jesus is asked, what is the greatest commandment? They thought they were going to trick him because there was like 400 or something laws that that the Pharisees were following. And then there was the Ten Commandments that we all know from Moses. And Jesus is asked, which one is the greatest? And they thought they were going to get him because anyone that he chose, you know, left another one out. And there would always be something to argue there. And instead, Jesus kind of baffles them. And Jesus says, well, the greatest commandment is... 
to love God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and body, and then to go and love your neighbor. And then after that, the next thing he does is he tells his disciples, he says, now you go and make disciples, which means you go do for others what I, Jesus, have done for you. And all the laws, all the rules, if you ever get confused about the Bible or Christianity or what you're supposed to do as a Christian, it's easy. You just go back to that, that greatest commandment, because Jesus' love encompasses everything. And it's because of Jesus' love that he invites us to do the same for others, because something magical has happened here today. Something spiritual has happened here today. Today, we've made the decision that we're going to stop talking out of one side of our mouth and then believing something for ourselves out of the other. And we're just going to be the same person in here that we are out there. And the thing that we hope for and beg for and ask God to do for us and ask our friends to do for us and our spouses to do for us, we're going to turn around and we're going to start doing that for others. So as much grace as you know you need in your life and as thankful as you are that God gives it to you or your spouse or your friends give it to you, it's now time to take a little bit of ownership and to go out and give that back. To stop saying, I don't care. To stop saying, I've already tried it. To stop saying, it's not my fault. Instead, say, wow, okay, if Jesus did this for me, then let me go and do this for another person. Now, Jesus takes a story, and I love this story because it's so simple. Jesus t- takes this... It, it, it's not actually a story. I, I do want to get that straight. In, in Matthew, which is where we're going to be looking at, Matthew is writing about a conversation that Jesus had. And if you're old school and you've got an old school Bible, or I don't know if the Bible app does this, but these are the red letters. Now, I used to always love reading the red letters in the Bible because I thought, well, this is cool. This is what Jesus said. Like These are the words that came out of his mouth. And so I would look through and I would look for the, the letters that were in red, just feeling like maybe there would be like an extra aura that would just wash over me because I'm reading all the, all the red letters. But today we're going to be looking at red letters, which means that Matthew is recording. This is what Jesus has said. These are things that came out of his mouth. These are things that he told us. And there's some meaningful things in here in such a simple story. I'm so excited for you guys to catch this and to unpack this for you. But we're going to start in Matthew 7, 3. Now, th- this, is, this is so good. Jesus was one of the best teachers. He was, he was one of the best storytellers. And he was so good at saying things in a way that made sense to people. He was so good at metaphors and analogies. He was so good at doing these things that he could talk to anybody, whether it be the rich and the famous or whether it be someone that was uneducated. He could, he could reach everyone. And he says this in Matthew 7, 3. I love this verse. He says, why do you... So this is Jesus asking a question. So imagine... That Jesus is, is here, and you guys are around him, and, and you want to be here. And he's saying, hey, people, why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? Now, when, when I read this verse... You know, I, I thought, I really tried to kind of put myself in your shoes or in other people's shoes and really unpack this and think, okay, very simply, what this verse tells me is, hey, as bad as I think the other person is, I'm even worse. That, that's my original takeaway from this verse is, okay, I think that the other person is bad because they have this sawdust in their eye, this, this little, these little particles, but in my life... I've got a plank in my eye, so Jesus is telling me that I'm worse than the people that I think are worse. That's my, that's my first takeaway from this. Now, thankfully, that's not the actual takeaway from this. See, what Jesus is doing here is he's trying to align your perspective. He's trying to get you to see things the way that he sees things. He sees things. See, Jesus says, why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye? So what Jesus is saying with this question is, why are you worried about what's going on there? Why are you worried about what's happening there in that person? 
Why are you worried about what's going on with your brother or your friend or your coworker? Or I don't know if, if any of you get so bitter that with, with a, a, a certain person that it almost becomes like every time that person interacts with your life, you're like, Ugh, I just don't like them. And then everything they do is highlighted to you. When Jesus is saying, hey, Pay no attention to them because you have a plank in your own eye. Now what Jesus is doing here is Jesus is applying weight and priority. So Jesus is saying, my first priority is you and your heart. My first priority is not to use you as a vessel to tell someone else that they have sawdust in their eye. My first priority as Lord and Savior is to get you to understand that I want to start doing something in your heart first. I want you to take... That this idea that the plank in your eye is actually a weighted importance, which is actually a burden and a conviction from Jesus that he wants to deal with you. He wants you to deal with yourself. He wants you to deal with what's going on in here before you start dealing with something that's happening there. In fact, I kind of phrase this another way. Jesus asked us, why are we so focused on what they did that you can't do anything about? rather than what you are doing that you can do something about. So Jesus is like, you can't do anything about what's happening in their life, but you can do something about what's happening in your life. See, it, it just boggles my mind how Jesus, in one statement, tries to just change our perspective. It's all about our perspective. And we never grasp fully how much Jesus wants to work in our life first. Now, Jesus goes on in this verse, and he says in, in 7 and 4, How can you say to your brother, Permit me to take the speck out of your eye, when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? So this is now Jesus' second question. First question was, how can you look at the speck in their eye when you have a plank in your own eye? Meaning, I want to deal with what's in your heart before we deal with what's in their heart. And now, the second question he's asking is, how do you say to them, hey, let me take the speck out of your eye. So how can you walk up to somebody and say, hey, you, you know that you're not doing, like, I need to hold you accountable. You know that this thing that you're doing wrong, I need to bring this to light. Like, we don't walk around. As, as spiritual or social or, or mental or emotional or intellectual police where we hold everyone else accountable for everything else that they say and we keep track of everyone else's sins and we follow each other around and we say, you know, I've noticed that you've got pride creeping up in your life because I've heard you say this and this and this and I just want to bring it to your attention that, hey, you're getting prideful. Nobody likes that. Nobody likes you if you're like that. And what Jesus is saying is, don't be like that. First deal with what's in here. And that's why he says, when. See, Jesus changes the perspective in this verse with the word when. This, this word, all the time, it, it's translated in the Greek to basically mean always. It's not very complicated. So what Jesus is trying to get through with this verse is that you always have a responsibility to work on you first before you work on someone else. You always have a responsibility to let Jesus work on you before you work on someone else. You always owe it to yourself to take ownership of what's happening in here before you try and help someone else out there. Is that making sense? Do we understand that? Is that something that, that, that resonates with you? It's hard. And the reason that it's hard to do that is because of this thing called pride. In fact, it's our, our pride. Our pride responds with, if they will let me fix them, then they will be able to see the situation as clearly as I do and see that I'm right. See, that, that, that's what our pride says. Our pride says, no, 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 it has to be them. It has to be. It's not me. And I can see so clearly what's wrong in their life. And if they would just let me fix this in them, or if they would just listen to my advice, then, then they would all of a sudden be able to see how clearly I can see it. Husbands, wives, how many of us, don't raise your hands, this morning in the kitchen had this happen in your marriage? I can firmly say that this did not happen in my marriage this morning because I got up and left earlier than Casey got up and did any, anything. But it's, it's, our, it's our pride. 
And this whole juxtaposition, this whole shift that Jesus is trying to do with this verse, it, it's not about you feeling like you're worse because you have a plank in your eye and they have dust in their eye. It's about you realizing that Jesus values first and foremost above everything else. He values dealing with you and your heart before you do anything else with anyone else. This is first to him. And you know what? That person out there that you hope sees it your way, you know what? Jesus is going to work with them as well. But you've got to let them go. You, whoo, there's a hard one. You've got to let go of them. And you've got to let them just be. And you've got to trust that Jesus is going to work on them. Now, what Jesus does next in these verses is he gives us a, a, a promise and he gives us a purpose. I wrote promise in here twice. I think that's my first typo in a year and a half here. I think it's pretty good. But Jesus gives a promise and he gives a purpose. Now, as we move forward in this verse, we're going to see this promise and this purpose. But this is where I want to introduce this idea of, of I want you to own the plank. I want you to own the plank in your life. See, Jesus is not telling us to mind our own business. He's telling us to start with our own business. I want you to, to take ownership of what's going on in your life and in your heart. Can we all afford to do that just a little bit? All of us have someone that we think should live a different way or be a different way. But you know what? Can we all just, can we all just say this morning while we're sitting here that all of us can afford just a little bit to own the plank. To say, okay, you know what? I have a plank in my eye. I get it. Yes. I admit this. This is my fault, as in it's a fault in me, but God, you want to work on the plank in my Fine. I'm going to own it, and I'm going to accept it. And when we do that, Jesus then goes on to actually give us this promise and give us the purpose to it. And he says in the next verse here in, in Matthew 7, 5, he says, you hypocrite. So he's talking to you, not me, you. <laughs> Yeah. Jesus says, that's a strong word. That's a strong word. But it's strong because Jesus wants to get through our, our thinking. He wants to get through, as my mom would say, your thick head. Jesus wants to penetrate and he wants to say, hey, you hypocrite. Because you're doing that thing where you talk out of one side of your mouth as opposed to the other. First, take the plank out of your own eye. And when we take the plank out of our own eye, Jesus gives us uh, a prayer where we can take a prayer of ownership. And this, this prayer of ownership says this. It says, Father, will you show me the part that I need to take ownership of? Will you show me what I need to take ownership of? Push your pride to the side. Take that relationship that's on your mind right now. Take the relationship where there's tension. Push your pride to the side and say this prayer. Father, can you show me the part in this relationship that I needed to take ownership of. And the promise here when we pray this prayer and we mean it is that Jesus promises clear vision. And we don't just get clear vision for the purpose of being able to see clearly because now the plank is maybe out of our eye. We get clear vision for a purpose. And that purpose we find in, in verse 5. And it, it says this. You can go to the next one. The purpose is to help our brother see clearly. That, that's, why, that's why Jesus wants to take the plank out of, out of our eye. Because Jesus wants us to be able to see clearly. And he wants us to help our brother see clearly. Now, th there's so much to this verse. And there's so much to this. I wish that I had more time to unpack it. I wish I had more time to go into it more. But, but I don't. But I also, I feel, like, I feel like this is simple enough for us, but this is also kind of where we need to stop. As a congregation, as a church, as a group of people, I, I, I feel such a strong sense, and it's a good sense, it's a good thing that Jesus, that the Holy Spirit is doing something in this room for us. That, that I want you to understand that, that, there's a, that when you drop your pride, and you let Jesus work in your life. And you recognize that Jesus' first priority is that you understand that your first priority is to let him work. That, that means you don't actually have to do anything. You just get to drop your pride and you get to sit in a chair, sit on the couch, go to Sea Point, sit by the ocean wall, 
and you just get to say, Lord, show me the plank in my eye. And it's not a plank because you're a, this bad of a person. It's a plank because God wants you to understand how important your heart is to Him. And when we show God that we're letting our pride down and we're going to let Him deal with that plank, and He pulls that out of our eye, and we see clearly, we then get to do what we said at the very beginning, where Jesus says, go and do this for other people. See, that's, that's our purpose, is to help our brother see clearly. Now, I, what I can imagine is, is instead of logging on to Facebook and seeing all the hate speech, instead of getting, you know, watching the news and seeing this person hates this person, I mean, wars get fought over this stuff. A war is being fought over this stuff. Instead, if something were to happen here, you know, magically, spiritually in this building, and then out from here, we all went out and we dropped our pride and we let Jesus work on what's going on here. And then we went out and, and we did this for other people. And all of a sudden, this amazing movement went across Cape Town and people started to say in the news, wow, Cape Town is this amazing city of love because all these people are going out and doing, you know, just, just taking forgiveness to the streets. I mean, that would be incredible. But you know what would be even more incredible to me today, right now, is if you went home different is if you went home and you walked up to that that person or you went to work on Monday and you walked into that relationship and you had prepared your heart to say Lord show me my part in this I put my pride to the side show me my part and what I think would be the most amazing thing is that tomorrow or this afternoon or whenever it was that you encountered this relationship it changed and it was different because let's go back to that whole I don't care thing. When we say I don't care about a relationship, we actually do care. We care greatly. We care so much that it's killing us on the inside. And that's why we come up with these defense mechanisms. And when we have these defense mechanisms, yes, we care. We, we care very much. Take that care and take this and, and let God do something. That to me is the win, is that you walk out of here and you take a step towards healing something that you've been carrying for years. Because Jesus did it for you first. Now, I'm going to say a prayer. And as I pray, the band will come out. But th this is such an important time. Because when you walk out of these doors, life happens. As soon as you get out. And some of you can't wait to get out there. Because you're feeling stirred up inside. And you're feeling like, I don't want to deal with this stuff. I don't want to deal with these relationships. But as soon as you walk out those doors, life happens. And it, then it's easy to kind of push everything to the side. It's easy to push it down. I'm amazing at suppressing emotion. My wife will tell you I'm first class at that. I'm amazing at just packing it in. But don't, let's not do that. So I want to give you a moment here where you could just reflect on that. And that's why we do this last, this last song. That's why I'm going to invite you to stand and worship after I pray. Because I just want you to take a minute, a minute and a half. And I want you to reflect. If you want to sing, sing. But if you just want to stand there or sit there and say, Okay, God, I understand and I accept that my heart is first priority for you. And I'm going to let you work in that heart. And then I'm going to take that into the relationships that I encounter. And together with each other and with God, we can begin to reassemble some of the hurt and reconcile it. So Lord, I pray that, that everyone...